Hello, my name is Kevin, and the title of this presentation is Becoming a Connected Learner, Professional Development Through Personal Knowledge Management. In this presentation, I'll discuss the changing nature of professional knowledge in the 21st century, the inability of traditional professional development policies to meet the needs of this changing knowledge environment, and the opportunities presented by the creation of personal knowledge management networks. These networks are based on a process described by Jarche as consisting of open and public seeking of relevant information, making sense of what is found and building upon it, and sharing that enhanced information back to others. I'll also talk briefly about the value of scaling personal knowledge networks up into organizational knowledge networks and community knowledge networks. So let's start with the discussion of the changing nature of professional knowledge today. Siemens described how in the past it was not uncommon for a professional to learn what she or he needed to know as part of their apprenticeship, education, or training and continue to use that same body of knowledge for their entire career. Today, however, the knowledge required to be a successful professional is constantly expanding and changing. This requires an unending process of learning and unlearning and requires continuous professional development. There's simply too much knowledge today to be kept inside the head of each individual, and instead information technology allows us to create networks of knowledge where information can reside within the minds of others and within the network itself and can be accessed when needed. To understand this, it's better to start thinking, um, as described by Downs, of, of knowledge as a process rather than as a static thing. A person doesn't read a stack of books and obtain some knowledge and then become a doctor. Instead, a person enters into a process of becoming a doctor through reading, but also through interacting with others, conversations, reflecting on experiences, and through extensive practice. Developing a personal knowledge network can be an important part of obtaining new knowledge, revising or discarding existing knowledge, reflecting on knowledge, and participating in knowledge communities. It can be an important part of the process of becoming a professional. In addition to the challenges of coping with an ever-growing and changing body of knowledge, many professionals also face a lack of institutional support for their professional development. In tough economic times, the PD budget can often be one of the first things to cut. For others, the kind of professional development made available by the organization might not fit with their learning objectives. Staff development is all too frequently limited to training courses taught using very traditional methods. And for others who work as independent consultants, there is no institutional support at all. For all these people, developing a personal knowledge management network can be a critical tool in staying up to date and competitive in today's knowledge economy. Okay, so what is a personal knowledge management network anyway? It's a self-directed, individual learning process where you take control of your own learning needs using an ever-growing set of open educational resources and social media technologies. To start, you must first establish your own learning objectives. Figure out what it is you want to learn. The next step is to search for the best learning materials to best meet your learning objectives. These materials must then be organized for later reuse. The information sources must also be evaluated and continually filtered to ensure that they continue to meet your identified learning objectives. In some cases, personal knowledge management networks also include automation tools to speed up the discovery and organization tasks. A key part of effective personal knowledge networks is what Jarche calls sense-making, the time spent reflecting and writing about the materials you've discovered and read, pulling them together in a meaningful way and increasing their value through contextualization. Finally, the results of the searching and sense-making should be shared with others who will themselves learn from your contributions. And those people will often share back with you, allowing you to learn from their network and their sense-making activities. So, let's take a look at each of these steps in more detail. Having control over what to learn and how to learn it is a key motivating factor identified by Malcolm Knowles in his Theory of Andragogy or Adult Learning. Personal knowledge management networks are particularly effective at this because the student, the learner, is completely in control over the process. No one else can set the learning objectives and the learner can change them whenever necessary. 
It's important for the learner to initially focus on just one or two areas of knowledge, such as early childhood education or urban planning or organizational development. There's so much information available that a lack of focus can quickly result in information overload and a sense of sinking. And of course, these can always be changed at any point in the process as new interests arise or other ones become less of a priority. The next step in developing your personal knowledge management network is to start seeking relevant information. Information sources can include things like blogs and wikis, online groups, Twitter, online journals, ebooks, online reports and documents, webinars, online videos, and free open online courses. The growth of open access publishing, as described by Walensky, and open educational resources, as described by Bonk, is ensuring high-quality content is increasingly available for independent learners. The next step in developing your personal knowledge management network is to begin the continual process of evaluating your information sources. This is important to ensure that your sources remain useful and focused and that any less credible sources are removed. This will help you avoid becoming overwhelmed. Shirky summarized this nicely in his statement that the problem isn't information overload, but instead is filter failure. We can't stop the ever-growing amount of information that's available, but we can work hard to develop the best filters to meet our needs. Be careful, though, not to only include sites in your network that you agree with. It's important to include a breadth of credible information in your network, and having contrary opinions as part of it can be useful in stimulating new ideas and innovations. The main thing to remember, though, is that you're in control of this process, so tweak it as required. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed, increase the filtering. If you feel like you're missing out, ease off it a little. It's up to you. Next, as you begin discovering more and more information sources, you'll need to start organizing them to avoid getting overwhelmed and to help with future recall. There are many tools and strategies available out there, including social bookmarking sites like Delicious, social citation management sites like Zotero, and information management tools like Evernote. All of these can help you stay in control of your increasing body of knowledge and ensure you can quickly and easily dip into them when necessary. The next step can be to investigate options for automating some of this work. Many people find it a challenge to keep on top of their personal knowledge management tasks and finding a good automation strategy can help. Tools for this include RSS feeds to pull blog and journal content into a single location, saving you the need to visit each site individually. Twitter lists that can centralize relevant tweets. Google alerts that will notify you of new information that's been added to the web. And new services like If This Then That, which provide advanced automation features. For example, you can set it up so that when you retweet a useful tweet, the link is automatically bookmarked for you in Delicious. It's very simple, but little time savers like these, repeated multiple times a day, can be extremely helpful. The next step is one of the most important, and also one of the hardest. This involves actually reading the content you've discovered, reflecting on it, and writing about it from your own unique perspective, often enhancing it with your personal experiences. Jarche calls this adding value to the information you've discovered, making it part of your deeper learning and professional development, but also enhancing it for others who will also benefit from your thoughts. Tools for sense-making can include personal blog writing, probably one of the most effective ways of getting inside a topic, grappling with it, and making it part of your own internal knowledge. It can be hard, and it can take time, but meaningful learning always takes some effort to add value can include commenting on the blogs of other people, or structuring your ideas into presentations like this one, or if you're even more creative, making videos like this. Information technology provides a wide variety of creative tools now to let you take the information you've found, explore it, think about it, and then create something new with it. The next step 
is to share what you've found with others and to also share your sense-making efforts. It's important to recognize that you are part of a wider network of learning involving hundreds or even thousands of others. Keeping this in mind can help to reduce or eliminate the sense of isolation that's a critical barrier in much online self-directed learning. Tools for sharing include many of the same ones used for your own searching, such as Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Delicious, and some newer tools like Scoopit and Paperly for creating your own online magazine based on knowledge sources you've gathered around the web. Sharing is a critical component to everyone's personal knowledge management strategy. We've spent some time now clarifying the many steps of personal knowledge management, including developing your personal learning objectives, seeking, filtering, organizing, automating, sense-making, and sharing. Now, I want to talk briefly about the benefits of implementing your own personal knowledge management strategy. One benefit is that it's free. Everything you need is freely available on the web. Now, some journal articles, webinars, or online courses may continue to reside behind paywalls, but there's so much out there now that you can often bypass these completely and meet your needs with open resources. The tools you need to develop your personal knowledge management network, like Twitter and Delicious, are also all freely available. Another benefit is that it puts you in control of your own learning. You decide what you want to learn, when you're satisfied with your learning, when you want to learn more or stop learning anymore, and when to move on. The absence of external authority is very liberating after being schooled for so many years. The use of personal knowledge management networks is powerful because it's social. Research by Huang and others tells us that learning with others is extremely effective not just in our acquisition of knowledge, but also, according to Harrington, Oliver, and Reeves, in reducing our sense of isolation, which can serve as a significant deterrent to learning. There are, however, a number of concerns that should be considered before continuing with the development of your personal knowledge management network. A big concern is time that following a personal knowledge management strategy will simply take too long. It is certainly true that it will take some time, but it will be an investment well made. Cantor suggests trying to fit it into your regular work routine wherever possible, spending some time, say, during your morning commute, searching for new information, ideally served up by your automation tools. Maybe dedicate an hour or so over lunch to reading some of the more relevant discoveries, and hopefully finding some time for reflection and sense-making in the afternoon or perhaps on the commute back home or even in the evening. It won't always be possible, but remember that you're in control of this process and that you can decide how much or how little time to devote to it. It'll certainly be a challenge, but it's definitely possible and definitely worth it. Another concern is privacy. Some people simply refuse to use social media tools for philosophical reasons, not wanting to share their data with the private corporations that run these tools. The services we've described are all free, but they do make claims to your data. You'll need to determine your own comfort level and act accordingly. Only you can tell whether the benefits of professional development via social media outweigh these privacy concerns. The continued growth in social media points to either widespread ignorance of this issue or a sufficient comfort level with the existing privacy policies, but it's something that you should consider for yourself before proceeding. Another concern is that some workplaces continue to block social media sites altogether, not understanding their opportunities for development. If you encounter this, you may try to educate up your decision-making ladder about the benefits of professional social media use or you may need to restrict your activities to your own devices. Issues of power and politics may also become apparent in the workplace, with employees possibly facing disciplinary action for statements made on online media sites. You'll need to measure the temperature of your own organization carefully and adjust your public statements accordingly. Another problem with personal knowledge management networks is that they tend to focus on explicit knowledge. 
that is, knowledge that's been written down or recorded somehow. Explicit knowledge is very valuable, but it does lose some of its context and detail when it makes the transition from tacit, the knowledge existing in the mind of the knower, to the page or to the screen. Personal knowledge management networks often miss out on the richness of real-time conversations, which are increasingly being recognized by writers such as Fagalo and Ryan for their value in knowledge management practices. Fortunately, technologies are rapidly advancing, which can allow for more live, online conversations. Tools like Skype, Google Hangout, and Blackboard Collaborate all allow for synchronous interactions, allowing for a richness being brought into the knowledge sharing process and a better path towards tapping into this so valuable tacit knowledge. So now we've looked at what a personal knowledge management network is, what its strengths are, and what some of the concerns are. In the final part of this presentation, I want to just briefly discuss how a personal knowledge management network can form the basis of a broader organizational knowledge management network and a community knowledge management network. Within an organization, employees and managers actively engaging in their personal knowledge management activities can be a critical component in building a learning organization. The methods employed can extend from personal sense-making to organizational sense-making, including things like after-action reviews, lessons learned, and other proven knowledge management approaches. The tools for implementing this can include all of the ones described earlier in this presentation, as well as private internal ones such as intranets, Yammer-based private chats, and organizational yellow pages describing everyone in the organization, as well as their expertise, their current projects, and their areas of interest. And personal knowledge management can also be the basis of building a learning society with individual citizens engaged in seeking, sense-making, and sharing around topics of common concern like parks, traffic, housing, or job creation. In summary, building a personal knowledge management network and applying it to your work, your organization, and your community can, one, develop you as a professional, making your skills more effective and providing greater success and satisfaction. Two, developing your organization, making it more effective in its goals and objectives and making it a better place to work. And three, developing your community, making it stronger and better able to achieve the wider goals of all of its members. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this presentation. If you have any comments at all, please contact me at kevin at stranick.ca.